Haiti, 1936. For Catherine Dunham, the American dancer and anthropologist, Haiti is the last leg of a year-long study of Caribbean dance. Her research into why black people dance the way they do should have been completed by now, but she's reluctant to go home. The more she observes, the more she understands. Dunham was tracing her own roots. You know, her roots as a black person, a person of African ancestry. She would have seen dance as a means of communicating, as a means of expressing life and living itself. The European influence now is also there, but the slaves and their descendants took many of the, the, the European influences and transformed them. And that is what the dance is about. I wanted to know what drove her, what made her go to the roots of her heritage. Her answer was really simple. She wanted to dignify the material. She had seen how this material that she was using as her source was such an integral part of the culture that it came out of. She wanted to bring that as truly and honestly as she could and put it on stage and show people its, its beauty and its glory. In Catherine Dunham's United States of 1936, the limit of what the black dancer could achieve is known as Negro dance. Well, if you were a black dancer, all you could aspire to was to be a shake dancer or a tap dancer or a contortionist or an acrobat, because that's all that was open to you. We needed to see another vision of what black dancers could do. The black dancer did not have a choice. Maybe if they were my skin color or maybe a little bit lighter, they might be able to get into the chorus line. They could not be in any of the evolving concert stage because they were black. They were between a rock and a hard place, literally. I had gained enough knowledge in the West Indies that I knew that I was doing some things from a point that was quite different from what the average person would see when he went to the theater or a rehearsal. When Dunham returns to Chicago, she realizes that new choreography will have to wait. She must first teach her dancers the movements she's experienced and their spiritual dimension. She tells her company they'll learn the steps of the gods. When she came back from Haiti, it was quite a revelation because we found ourselves doing things that did not even seem to me like dance anymore. There were a lot of voodoo movements and pelvic movements that our families were horrified when they saw us doing. A whole different concept of dance because we learned the spiritual part of the dance. In time, these movements become the foundation of an approach to dance known as the Dunham Technique, based on the principle of isolation. She formed this incredible movement system and that is uh, still prevalent today, although she's not given credit for it. You learn to move each part of your body separately as though it has no connection with the other part of your body. This was isolation of everything, the hands, shoulders, hips. The movement of the head, the snap of the finger, the wiggle of the knees and legs. I don't think anyone ever mastered it as well as she did. And contract. Dunham builds her technique on her knowledge of ballet, modern, and Afro-Caribbean dance. It covers the whole range of training the body to move. What was added 
were the African elements. Four. Her technique was the hardest technique I'd ever done. You did all the head movements. Head moves at the side. Now narrow with the feet. Head movements. I had never done this before, where she said, pull through the ear and go off on the side. All these things, spinning the head around. So the head dances. Yeah. Then we went to the shoulders. And up and down, and up and down. To the rib cage. And out first. Chest way out, clear. To the hips, how to contract and the hips front. Isolate the hips to the side, to the back, to the side. How to circle the hips, up and down. Take the hands up. Then you put all that together and you move across the floor. Right. 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 Circle it around. Reach out. But of all of the Caribbean movements Dunham teaches, the most exciting comes from the island of Martinique. There, men perform a fighting dance called the Agia, a fusion of African and European combat styles. The Agia developed because slaves were not allowed to possess weapons. The Agia is martial art disguised as dance. As a tool, Dunham uses film she shot in Martinique to teach the dance to her company. She decides to build her first new choreography around the drama of the Agia. Dunham premieres her dance in Chicago on January 27, 1938, less than a year after her return from the West Indies. It was just a love story of a fishing village. I was a fisherman, she was the girl, and the devil was the other one, who was mean. But it, it, it was just a, a Romeo and Juliet. Catherine Dunham is one of those people who could be dismissed as an anthropologist, lifting things from the field onto the stage, not at all. She was an artist as well, and uh, in fact, a theatrical artist. She understood the theater of much of what she saw in the field. She knew that she wanted to make this material palatable to a broad audience, but she was definitely going for the heart and the essence of a culture. Lagia becomes an instant success. But Caribbean-inspired material is not all Dunham wants audiences to appreciate. All along, she sought to build respect for African-American themes as well. The chance to do this comes when the company is invited to New York City. In a new show for Broadway, Tropics and La Jazz Hut, she creates a duet she calls Barrel House Blues, it's based on the slow drag, a couple's dance common to the juke and the honky-tonk. The piece is controversial for audiences in 1940. Barrel House Blues was depicting the time in Chicago when it was cold, and just knowing this lonely woman who felt a little beat up went on in a bar and, and had the time of her life, just for a moment, finds this young man and fantasizes. <laughs> Critics were just baffled. They were ignorant to the fact that this was a combination of the authentic with the artistic. So they reverted back to their safety of, it was sizzling, it was hot, it was torrid, it was sexy and all that business. Though the reviews are enthusiastic, they're laced with a tone of condescension. John Martin, America's leading dance critic, calls Barrel House Blues an incredible vulgarity in the New York Times. Like any innovator, you're bound to give your audience trouble, and Catherine Dunham did. 
what they saw, many a critic dismissed as cabaret. And they felt it had no depth. That wasn't true. It was sassy, and she was courageous. She would always take risks, always with her material. Even though they may uh, criticize her, like maybe that was too risque, she wanted them to know we're complex people. Here's someone who said this is important, vernacular dance. The idea of looking at the blues experience in the body, the idea of looking at the jazz experience in the body, the idea of looking at the spiritual experience in the body through dance, that's a powerful legacy. John Martin said, when he was reviewing Catherine, it's not designed to delve into philosophy or psychology, but to externalize the impulses of a high-spirited, rhythmic, and gracious race. And I asked Catherine at one point about her feelings about John Martin's take on what she did. And she said in this very, very ladylike, subdued way, he was trying to be helpful. And that's essentially the way you have to look at it. The man's not trying to be malicious. He's not trying to be mean. He just doesn't get it. And he's not the only critic who didn't get it. Celebrity ignites a hectic pace for Dunham. She lectures at Eastern colleges on Caribbean culture, writes magazine articles for Esquire under the pseudonym Kay Dunn, and lands a starring role in the hit Broadway musical, Cabin in the Sky. What she had was a combination of magnetism, sexuality, and pure impact that can only be described as star quality. She had that power that when she came upon the stage, you had to look at her. This was Catherine Denham. She was helped a great deal by her husband, John Pratt, who was such a creative person with lights and sets and, and knew just how to costume her. John Pratt was such an integral part of Catherine Dunham and the Catherine Dunham Company. You might want to call him Mr. Catherine Dunham, but he was stronger than that. It was a fascinating relationship because they were both very strong. They were both geniuses at what they did. And I know Miss Dunham inspired him. Dunham also acquires a reputation as a woman to be reckoned with. In 1943, she tangles with the director of the film, Stormy Weather. Stormy Weather stars Bill Bojangles Robinson and Lena Horne, but it's Dunham who steals the show. Well, there's that wonderful scene in Stormy Weather when um, there's the kind of breakaway and Lena Horne is standing beside the window. Of course, Lena's the star of, of Stormy Weather. But let's face it, when we pan away to Catherine Dunham and she stands with her, her 40s fashions, the hat tilted to the side of the head, one sees power. But she actually has to negotiate her place and her sense of self and her sense of who the black dancer was in America at that point with the director of the film. He wanted the whole scene to be the hookers and pimps on the street. She says, no, nothing doing. All of a sudden, we're in another world, a dream world. She has negotiated in that particular film a sense of our perspective on who we are, this larger sense of the black self that we ourselves define.
The Dunham Dance Company is one of the best known dance groups in the world, and yet it is difficult keeping the troupe going. The Dunham Company was characterized by the fact that it was constantly in a state of bankruptcy. It could be a little less bankruptcy or a little more, but the basic uh, situation was always uh, either mild or extreme desperation. To pay the bills, the company tours constantly and performs in nightclubs and private functions. Celebrity is a mixed blessing. We were traveling and performing in a, in a time of extreme segregation. In the war years, we got mixed in with troop trains and army personnel would get very hot about it. They'd begin to smolder. They would pass through our car, which they were not supposed to do, and uh, let loose with epithets like, uh, how, come, how come the niggers have got sleeping accommodations and we don't? But Dunham refuses to be intimidated. At every turn, she uses her fame to counter racism. Wherever she goes in the US, she tells the press about hotels which deny her accommodation. She rejects engagements before segregated audiences and speaks out on civil rights for Negroes, even during World War II, when some thought it unpatriotic. With the goal of victory overseas and at home, African-American artists used their talent during the war to protest inequality. In 1943, Pearl Primus, a young modern dancer, stuns her audience with a solo about lynching. This is an all-out war, she writes. We will not stop fighting until everyone is free. Primus sets her dance without music to the words of Lewis Allen's poem, Strange Fruit. Southern trees bear a strange fruit. Blood on the leaves and blood at the root. That a black man had been killed, he had been hung, maybe he had been shot, that a black man had to have suffered these iniquities. And here Pearl Primus, a black dancer, had the audacity to take the story of hate, of sadness, of murder, and put it on the stage as a violent solo. No other dancer had gone that far to do a dance of that style. Pastoral scene of the gallant South. The bulging eyes and the twisted mouth. There was a great deal of pain in the movement as she contorted her body to show the utmost pain and suffering of the human spirit. Scent of magnolia. Sweet and fresh. And the sudden smell of burning flesh. Despite the unsettling nature of Primus' solos, she is widely embraced by the modern dance world and by audiences. This notoriety is a surprise, especially to Primus, who wanted first to be a doctor, then an anthropologist. A part-time job takes her to the new dance group, and it's here she hones her dance technique and political edge. The new dance group was a, a very unique organization. They felt that dance was for everyone, and their motto was dance is a weapon for social justice. I think it was the only place in New York that was integrated. 
It wasn't only one technique or one form. It was everything. And that's what made the new dance group, the fact that not only was it everything in dance, it was also everything in people. But within a year of her debut, Prima stops performing altogether. To create dances of consequence, she feels she has to learn more about black people and their ways. Eager to use her recent training in anthropology, she travels to the Deep South. She ends up in the Black Belt of Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina, and immerses herself into everyday life. She disguises herself as a migrant farm worker, picking cotton, harvesting fruit, practically any work that would let her learn by observation and participation. I think that the pull to anthropology by African-American women is this pull to try to understand their own role, their marginal role in American society. And they become true participant observers and try to bring back different notions of what it means to be a woman, what it can mean to be an African-American. As her experiences unfold, all that Primus observes becomes potential source material. She pays particular attention to how ordinary people move at work and at play, noting how similar these movements are among black folk. But it's the religious rituals of rural blacks that have the greatest impact on her. She's searching for the roots of African-American spiritualism that informs uh, our religious rituals with dance movement, with uh, almost extroverted expression of, of spiritual fervor, and it's that the body is inhabited by these spirits, and they come out. Primus creates a slew of new dances based on her southern field work, often performing at political rallies and fundraisers. Her most famous piece, Hard Time Blues, heightens her reputation as an activist artist. They had hard, hard times, Lord, all around. Meal barrels into crops burned to the ground. Great God Almighty, folks, be with bad, lost everything they ever had. Great God Almighty, folks, be with bad, lost everything they ever had. But after the war, Primus pays a price for her militancy. She's called before the House Un-American Activities Committee and has her passport revoked. Once before a performance in Harrisburg, Virginia, she is spat upon, stoned, and called a red. Undeterred, Primus continues to dance. Then, in 1948, the president of the Rosenwald Foundation, which funded Catherine Dunham's research 14 years earlier to the Caribbean, sees Primus perform and offers to fund a research trip for her to Africa. Of the many dances she learns there, her favorite is the first she learns, the fanga. Fanga was a dance of welcome. I ask the earth and the heavens to welcome you. You are a guest in my community. You are a guest in my home. When Pearl introduced us to the Fanga, we studied and listened to the rhythms very closely because the music and the dance were very closely integrated. They were one. Elders in over 30 tribal groups teach Primus their dances. she films them for future reference, 
It is only when she joins in that she grasps the full meaning of dance. This was a way for her to be there firsthand as a witness, as a participant, uh, as part of the culture. And she stayed there long enough to really become absorbed in the material that she was studying. And all along, dance is at the center of this cultural exploration, this search for who she is. Africans recognize a strong kinship in her dancing. They give her the name Omawale, which means child returned home. For the next 30 years, Pearl Primus will become one of America's foremost teachers of African dance. She realized the power of Africa and that Africa had something to teach us about negotiating one's identity and meaning in life. It's all been a part of dance for, for blacks. Africa in the Americas is a very important cultural and historical phenomenon. African slaves could preserve things like music and dance. These are things which are outside the reach of the oppressor. So those persisted with a vengeance. There is such a thing as an African cultural continuum in Brazil, in the Caribbean, in um, black North America. There are movements, there are languages, there are artistic expressions that have roots in Africa but have been transformed in the New World. African American artists want to find connections. They take so much from the past and honor it and change it and transform it. And it's that quality that is perhaps most indicative of a black aesthetic. The aesthetic and cultural continuum that stretches from Africa to various black cultures in the New World has always been a potent force. It's passed from one generation to another. It's passed from one body to another through dance. It's passed from one voice to another through music. It's a lived tradition. It's a lived tradition. By the late 1940s, young dancers who had cut their teeth with Primus and Dunham begin to leave. Some join established companies which are slowly opening their doors to blacks. Several Dunham dancers choose to teach in the school she creates in 1945. A select few, however, seek their own individual voice and dance. One of Dunham's original dancers, Tally Beatty, is among the first of her company to strike out on his own. People who left her, if they formed a company of their own, they were doing a weak imitation of Catherine Dunham, except one person, Tally Beatty. He was the best dancer that she had. When Tally branched out on his own, he made wonderful works. Tally had power, he had excitement, and he had an amazing...